Hi everyone, I'm Miss Corey. This is Miss Kristen. We're your kids ministry team and we are so excited to have you joining us with our family worship experience today. Now, if you are a kid, we have a little bit of roll call for you today. So if you are in pre-K through kindergarten, I'm gonna say something and you're gonna holler back. Hopefully you remember what it is. But when I say, hey everybody, you say, hey everybody, just like that. So ready, hey everybody. Hey everybody! Awesome, if you are in first through third grade, I want you to give us really big waves. If you are in fourth through fifth grade, you're probably too cool for us, so just give us like a little wave right here. And if you are in our student ministry, you are definitely too cool for us. <laughs> so just know that we are so glad that you are here and a part of this with us. I'm gonna kick it to Miss Kristen and she's gonna explain why we're so excited about this family worship experience and what a great opportunity it is. Thanks, Miss Corey. We are so excited to start our reopening journey with you, our church family. As a church, we hold community and discipling the next generation as some of our highest values. And so for the next little while, we get to do that together. Whether you be here uh, next week in our worship center or you're still joining us online, we're going to be together as a big family, all the generations. And this is a great opportunity to worship together, to teach our littlest church members about God's love and about community. So things may look different, but join us as we make a joyful noise for the Lord. Now let's sing together. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive you Called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We'll shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We'll shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We'll shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens. Awakens, awakens, awakens me. Why 
I'm with Pastor Gary. Uh, Gary, thanks for being here. This is, for those of you who don't know, this is Gary DeBoard. Gary is our um, family and missions yeah. pastor. So I know many of you out here today are taking this in as a family. And, and next week when we're, we're all together, uh, have an opportunity to come back and actually sit in these seats. Right. We're going to be doing it as families. So excited about that too. Yeah, we want to take yeah. just a minute and talk to talk to families today. So yeah. first of all, Gary, uh, tell us about your family. So um, we have uh, my wife and I have three kids. Uh, used to have who's your wife? So my wife is Jackie. Jackie's been the star of the pandemic, right? She's she's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. she's she's pretty good. So she's been up here on stage singing, um, and uh, she just had our baby a couple weeks ago. Um, and everything's going great. So uh, his name is Parker. Um, and then we have Aubrey, uh, who's going into kindergarten in the fall. And then Max, who uh, is going into second grade in the fall as well. Awesome. Are you getting any sleep? Not, not a lot. Uh, I'm getting more sleep than Jackie. So um, we're, we're making it work, though. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to read the scripture yeah, today and then sure. just give you an opportunity to you know, share a brief word with, yeah. with our families. So um, last week we were in Acts chapter 10, and we kind of looked at the whole thing. And we're going to drill down today on one of the concepts in there. So I'm, I'm reading from Acts 10, 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So Gary, as you, as you hear that and you think of our families that are watching, what, what's a big idea that you'd like to, like to share with our kids and families today? Well, I think the one that kind of jumps off the page is the idea that, that he comes to this realization where he realizes that God just doesn't show favoritism. Yeah. Um, and in the context of the historical context and the context of the Bible, <clears throat> that's such an amazing uh, thing because uh, in the Jewish mind, God did absolutely show favoritism. Uh, but Jesus came... Uh, and he kind of smashed that dividing wall. Um, and he's, he's seeing, as he writes that, that truly God doesn't show favoritism at all. God, God loves, uh, in, in this context, the Jew, and God also loves the Gentile as well. Yeah, so as you, you think of families, you think of your own kids. Yeah. I mean, Max and Aubrey and Parker when he grows up. What, what do you want them to take away yeah. from this? Well, one of the things that I want them to know, um, first of all, is... Uh, who they are in relation to God, uh, that, that they stand um, as sinners uh, next to a God who is holy and righteous, but in God's love and in God's mercy and his compassion, uh, he sent his son Jesus to die for them so that uh, they could be saved, they could be rescued. Um, and I want them to grow up with that understanding that, um, that they uh, can be rescued uh, from their own sin, not because of anything they've done, um, but because of the mercy that God has shown them. And I want that, that mindset to kind of pervade uh, through everything they do. I want that to be the lens they see the world through because I really believe that when we truly understand who we are in relation to who God is um, and the, the extent to which God uh, showed and demonstrated his love to us through Jesus, we have this innate, uh, overflowing, compelling humility that comes out of us because we understand who we are and the incredible act of love that God showed us. So I want my kids growing up, and that's my prayer and that's Jackie's prayer, is for our kids to understand that in the, in the deepest possible way. I don't want my kids just to grow up knowing um, that they should do this and shouldn't do this. I want them to know why, and I want um, them to be compelled uh, to make good choices because they understand uh, that Jesus made this incredible choice for them. Uh, and so uh, in so many ways, um, I want them to have that same realization uh, that we read here in Acts 10. Yeah. So that's the gospel. Absolutely. It that's is. the yeah. essence of the gospel. Yeah. And part of, part of who God is, God does not show favoritism. Right. So how does that translate? How do you communicate that to kids? Yeah. I mean, what, yeah, what does and, that look like? Yeah, so I think that, you know, in our, not just our culture, but in our world, the way that we see the world, whether we're an adult or we're a kid, um, there are divisions all over the place. There are, there are things that make us different. Um, and I think that so often uh, it's just natural for kids, you know, in, in school especially, uh, to see this group of kids or that group of kids. And the differences could be for whatever reason. It could be because of their skin color. It could be because of their... Uh, their interest or their ideologies or whatever it is. There are 
always differences. And I think the, the amazing thing about Jesus is he gives us um, a common language to speak, those of us who have decided to follow him. And for kids, um, I think I want kids to understand that that, um, that common language, that, um, that, that common thing that he has given us the opportunity all to possess is the thing that actually unites us, is the thing that actually in so many ways um, makes us the same regardless of our differences. And so I think that when we uh, read this passage in Acts 10 and when um, you know, we, we talk to our kids about it, we want to help them to understand that this applies uh, to their everyday lives. So when they uh, go to, to places in which they're in social context, uh, people that are different than, than, than them um, are, are loved by God as well because uh, they are made in God's image just like you know, my kids or our kids are made in God's image as well. So when I understand that truth, yeah. my kids understand that truth right. at the most basic level, then we can't help but respond. Absolutely. And it's, it's, that, it's that compelling nature of the, you know, once we truly understand the gospel and what that means, not just for the world, but what it means for me, um, you know, one of my kind of core principles just as a, as a, as a, as, as a, as a pastor, as a dad, as a, just a Jesus follower, is that when I understand that I am compelled to live a certain way, I'm compelled to live uh, a, a certain way and make certain decisions and think in certain ways because I understand so deeply that, that I was different and, and God in his love uh, showed me a mercy that I didn't deserve. And so that informs the way I think and the decisions that I make because at the end of the day, how could I not um, be that way because uh, of the love that's shown for me. It's this incredible uh, gratitude um, that should just kind of almost overflow out of us the more we understand the gospel uh, and the more we put ourselves in a place uh, to be changed by the gospel more and more. And that's our mindset. Yeah. That's our mindset. Sure. So I appreciate you sharing that word uh, with us today. Pastor Gary, would you mind uh, just praying for us? I'd love to, absolutely. Sure. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you are our rescuer, first of all, that we individually were lost and were without hope, that we were separated from you. And God, we know that there was nothing we could have done uh, by the strength of our own abilities or positions to uh, affect any change. But in your love and mercy, you saw us in our lostness and you came to find us. And you saved us. And now we stand today, those of us who have decided to follow uh, you, Jesus, as redeemed people, as rescued people. And um, we, we live in a world that desperately needs that good news. And God, I pray that you would help us all to, um, to go out and to, to take the, the truest message of the gospel, the gospel that has changed us, and may you uh, empower us, enable us uh, to spread that message so that that message can change others. And God, may everything we do, may the love we show, may the kindness that we uh, show to others be only because of the love that you have shown us, of the kindness that you have shown us. And when we talk to our kids about things they should do or shouldn't do, may we always take it back to the gospel. When we um, tell our kids that they uh, should be kind. May they understand from us um, that they should be kind because first of all, Jesus was kind to them. And may we help them, may we help ourselves to be compelled by this gospel, by this good news. God, we pray for our world today and pray that, that this good news would be pervasive. Uh, and God, uh, you would help us all uh, to take this message into the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What a joy it is to be together today. Thanks so much to Pastor Gary for that powerful prayer and that powerful, simple message that we want for our kids, we want for our families to be centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to follow Jesus. We want to be changed by him, and we want to be on mission for him. So that's what we're about. That's what we want our kids. That's what we want our families. That's what we want everybody who calls Community Church of Greenwood home that's what we are about. So as I think about our church family, 
I want to see uh, everybody tuned in tonight at 7 o'clock on Facebook Live. We're going to have a family meeting, and we're going to share some of our plans for the rest of the summer and then into the fall. Because of all the crises that have hit, we are still on mission as disciples of Jesus Christ. And I can't wait until next Sunday. Right now, I'm looking at an empty worship center. Next Sunday, I hope that so many of you are here in person because we can come back together face to face. We're still going to offer online services for those who aren't ready yet to come back. So wherever, wherever you are, we want you to keep uh, staying engaged and keep learning and keep growing as a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, today we are in a difficult time as a nation. And I'm going to just cut right to the chase because I believe God's word is absolutely critical for us today. And I want to set some context and then dive right into really some, some challenging stuff. So I'm going to lean on uh, one of my favorite ambassadors for Christ. And that's former Indianapolis football coach, uh, Indianapolis Colts football coach, Tony Dungy, uh, follower of Jesus, Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champion. This is what Coach Dungy says. He says, today we are a divided country. We're divided racially, politically, and socioeconomically. And Satan is laughing at us because that is exactly what he wants. Dysfunction, mistrust, and hatred help his kingdom flourish. Well, what is the answer then? I believe it has to start with those of us who claim to be Christians. We have to come to the forefront and demonstrate the qualities of the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. We can't be silent. As Dr. King said many years ago, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But we can't go forward with judgmental, bitter spirits. We need to be proactive, but do it in the spirit of trying to help make things better. And it can't be just the African-American churches. It has to be all churches taking a stand and saying, we are going to be on the forefront of meaningful dialogue and meaningful change. We have to be willing to speak the truth in love, but we have to recognize that we are not fighting against other people. We are fighting against Satan and his kingdom of spiritual darkness. In the words of the Apostle Paul, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And as I hear those challenging and very helpful words from Coach Dungy, I'm reminded that he, he draws us to God's word and he reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle. So we want to go to God's word today. And Pastor Gary and I already set this up, but we've been in Acts 10 and we've been looking at the conversion of the Roman centurion named Cornelius and how Peter shares the gospel with him. And I believe that God has a particular pinpoint word for us today from this same chapter. And I want to come back to this and help us see the heart of God more clearly today. So in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So as we think about that term, every nation, we're reminded of Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. We would have celebrated that last week. That would have been Pentecost Sunday. But at Pentecost, we, the, the Spirit descends and we hear uh, all different languages being spoken. That people hear the message of the gospel in all different languages. And what's so beautiful about that truth is that the gospel from its inception was not in one language. The King James Bible wasn't spoken right then. We are multilingual, multicultural, every nation from the start of the church. And then we can turn to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, and see how this new heaven and new earth, what it will look like. The Apostle John says this, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So we see all nations. We see the church starting here. We see the culmination of Jesus' return. It will be every nation. That is a beautiful picture for us to see. God does not 
show favoritism. But what that means is something even deeper than that. Because let's continue. You know the message of God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. So we know that Jesus is Lord of all and we know that he brings peace. Peace is what we need in our times today. But the peace that God is talking about, the peace of God's word, is this, that it is sin that separates us from God. That the actual war is a spiritual war. That my sin is what separates me from God. And Jesus died on the cross for all nations. And it is through our faith and our trust in him that we are saved. So regardless of my skin color, regardless of your skin color, regardless of the language we speak, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus died for all who place their faith and trust in him. So as we hear that truth today, we just need to be reminded that all nations have equal access through faith in Jesus Christ. So that is God's heart. We see this in Matthew 28 when Jesus is giving the great commission to his disciples and this is what we're about as a church. He says, go into all nations and proclaim the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you and I will be with you even until the end of the age. So there's a heart of God. There's a picture of this that God has for us today that is not just in Acts 10 but runs from the entire Bible that is a complete story that is ultimately fulfilled in the book of Revelation. But today, my friends, as we look at this truth, as we look at the heart of God, we understand that we are in the midst of a storm. Several weeks ago when this pandemic began, we said that uh, we were in a storm. And we went back to the Sermon on the Mount, and we said that uh, Jesus says the wise man, the wise person, builds his house on the rock of God's Word, in obedience to God's Word. And that is our foundation. So when, when the storm hits, and the storm has hit, I don't know how it has hit your family exactly, but it has hit financially, it has hit emotionally, it has hit physically, and it's hit our country in ways that perhaps we could not even have imagined a few months ago. But what we have is the foundation of God's word and obedience. So when the storm hits, will our house stand? Will the faith that we have, will the trust that we have stand? And what Jesus tells us is it's only on the rock of Christ that it will stand. So that's where we need to be today, is standing on the rock of God's Word. So let's talk about this process that this Scripture can lead us to today. When we look at Peter himself, he says, I now realize how true it is. I have now realized is a process. I have now realized means I now understand something that I didn't quite grasp before. This word realize can mean understand. It can mean I now take ownership. I take possession of this truth that God does not show favoritism, that God sent his son Jesus to die for all nations. So this is a process. And as we think about there is knowledge that comes only from God's word, that this is the start of the process to to understand this truth. The apostle Paul uh, in, in Ephesians 1.18, as he prays for the church, he doesn't pray for circumstances to change. He prays simply that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. So as we understand this truth at our head level, at a knowledge level, we know that, that it needs to, to penetrate from here to here. Paul also says this in Philippians 1.9 and 10. He said, this is my prayer that your love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you would be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. So there is a process of thinking, of discerning, 
of growing that moves from the head to the heart that is rooted in love. And that is the beginning of the process. From head to heart and then the hands that act. So today as we think, how do we respond in the midst of our time? What are you to do? What am I to do? What are we to do in the midst of this spiritual battle? I believe Dr. Tony Evans has a helpful metaphor to put this in context. So I borrow from Dr. Evans and, and, and have made some modifications. But as you look at this, as you think about this, um, when you drive a car, you have a rearview mirror that allows you to see what's behind you. And you have a windshield that allows you to see what is in front of you. So as we, we look at the rearview mirror, we look at our past. And for many of us today, that is a painful look. We may have our own personal pain. We ha may have our own personal stories. But as we think about the times we are in, when we look at social unrest, when we look at systematic racism, when we, we look back, some of us look back to our own family history. And I have family members. I have, I have uncles who lived in the South, and when they integrated the schools, they shut them down. There's a history of racism in my own family. Many of you share that. We can keep looking back. And as I remember fourth grade Indiana history, they didn't talk about the Klan in the 20s. They didn't talk about some of the painful chapters in our local history in Indiana, in Greenwood. They didn't talk about real estate practices that were discriminatory, judicial processes that were discriminatory. So there's a lot in our past that is very painful. We can go all the way back and we can think about American history and we can think about how the Bible was used to justify slavery, how the Bible was used, how churches defended slavery, defended segregation, defended racist practices. I can think back all the way to Frederick Douglass, 1845. He writes his slave narrative and he says, I hate the religion of the South. I hate the religion of the slaveholder, but I love the Christianity of Christ. And it is that tension that sometimes we have to lean into and remember as a church. So as we look in the rear view and as we examine our own history, we have conversations. I've been having conversations with my own family. What do we need to look at? How do we need to look at history? How do we need to see clearly our past? But as we look at that rear view mirror, it's also interesting what you see on that mirror. It says, objects are closer than they appear. Sometimes that past is closer than we want to admit. But at the same time, as we see that rearview mirror, we know that compared to the windshield, that mirror is smaller. So as we look forward into the windshield of hope, we see this picture of all nations. We see this picture of peace through Jesus Christ that is accessible to all who put their faith and trust in him. The other day, I, I saw a glimpse of this picture. I was uh, in, in my small group, and, and we were talking about, uh, you know, how are we processing these times? And uh, one of the guys in my group, he says, hey, hey I live in a neighborhood, and we have, uh, we have families from Burma and Mexico and Colombia and Kenya and Chicago. <laughs> and he said, you know, I have, I have friends in my small group from El Salvador and Ethiopia. And I thought, what a beautiful picture. What a beautiful glimpse of the kingdom. And that, my friends, as we look at that today, is a picture of what it ought to look like. As I picture those kids playing together and I picture small groups together, different nationalities, different languages, but united in Christ. I'm reminded of Paul's letter to the Galatians where he says, in Christ... In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no slave or free. There is no male and female. All are one in 
Christ Jesus. And as we look at all that divides us today, I believe we could add some other categories. If we are one in Christ, there's no Republican or Democrat. There's no right or left. There's no conservative or liberal. Yes, we have differences. Yes, we have people who vehemently debate and disagree. And even as we look forward to the kingdom, as we look forward to what will be one day, as we look forward to the not yet, we are in the mess of the right now. And we are in the mess of division and disagreement. So our question as we look in the windshield, as we look to the hope that we have in Christ, may what we see ahead of us as we look to the character of God, as we look to God's Word, as we see a vision of the kingdom, will that be greater and that, will that be clearer than everything that's on the side? All the things that are distracting us, all the things that are pulling us away from this vision of the character and glory of God, of what God has done for us, His love for all people, and our love for Him and our love for each other. So as we think today, as we look through that windshield, and as we try to discern what is God teaching us today, what are we to learn from this moment in time as individuals, as families, and as a church, what do we do? Well, we remember, as Coach Dungy told us, that we are, in fact, in a spiritual battle. And if we're to go all the way in that rearview mirror, we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We can go all the way back to Genesis 3. And what did the evil one say in the garden? Did God really say, don't eat the fruit? When we look at spiritual attack, it always begins with a questioning of God's character. Did God really say, is this word really true? Is this rock really solid? Can I really trust in the goodness and character of God? Can I trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can I trust in the Holy Spirit to guide me and lead us through these times? We always have an evil one that will say, is this really true? Did God really say? We have an evil one who will seek to kill and steal and destroy and divide. But my friends, as we look in the windshield today, may that which unites us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, may that be stronger than anything, anything, anything that could divide us. And I know as I've had conversations with many of you in our congregation, we still have different ways of seeing things, different ways of looking at politics, different ways of looking at legislation and leaders. We can have those differences. We can agree to disagree agreeably and still be focused on what matters most, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what steps are we to take today? I believe even though it's confusing and hard and awkward, the way forward is is clear. As we look through that windshield and we may see cracks, we may see fog, we may see things that distort our vision, but may we keep our eyes on the light of God's Word. May we keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. So how do we do that? Number one, we have to pray. We need to be individuals, families, churches who pray. And what does that prayer look like? We can can pray for circumstances to change. We can pray for God to intervene in our country, in our communities. But I believe it begins with praying that we can see the character and glory of God clearly. And as we see that, as we see God's character, then we begin to search our own hearts. The end of Psalm 139, David says, Search my heart. And see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. So that is where our prayer begins. May I see God clearly and may that truth penetrate my own heart and reveal 
what I need to see in the rear view, what we need to see in the rear view as a church. But then may we look through the windshield that is even bigger as the Lord leads us, as the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, as the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are God's children. May the Spirit remind us that that which unites us is greater than that which divides us. So we need to pray. Secondly, we need to learn. We need to listen. We need to be in God's Word. I hope and pray that we are in God's Word more than we're on social media. I pray that we are learning the truth more than we are simply listening to the opinions of everybody in the world. I hope that we are grounded in the foundation of God's Word. So we need to learn. We need to read the Bible. We need to read multiple perspectives. We need to talk with people who may not see exactly as we do. That is okay. It is okay to disagree about things that are not ultimate. But we do know this. We know that when we see God's heart clearly, and when we see what breaks the heart of God, what breaks the heart of God should break my heart, should break your heart, should break our hearts. So when we see things that violate, things that are evidence of favoritism, evidence of racism, that should break our hearts and should compel us to be a light for Christ and work towards change. So as we pray, as we learn, as we listen, ultimately, ultimately we are led to love. Peter later will say in his letter in 1 Peter 3.15, he will say, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have, but to do so with gentleness and respect. So as we prepare to love, as we prepare to say, God, what are you leading me to do? What are you leading my family to do? What are you leading us as a church to do to give a reason for the hope that we have? May we do so with humility. May we do so grounded in God's word. May we do so with a love for God that compels us to love and to share what Christ has done for us for all nations. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you that your word reveals your heart and that your heart is for all nations, all tongues, all people, that you sent your son to die for all. And all have access through faith in Jesus Christ. May we see your word clearly. May it penetrate our minds. May it change our hearts. And may it lead to loving actions that bring glory and honor to you and that grow your kingdom and ultimately bring honor to the one who is above all, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. As we continue to meditate on this truth that God does not show favoritism, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for all who put their faith and trust in him. We're reminded of the heart of the gospel, and we're reminded that uh, when we come to the communion table, we do it together, not just as a church family, but as churches throughout the world, different tongues, different nations coming together to celebrate what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. So we're reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples and he took the bread and he, uh, he broke it. And after, after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he, he took the cup and he said, this, is, this represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. So today as a church family, may we 
May we take the bread, may we drink the cup, and may we do this in remembrance of the one who died for all nations, all people, who shed his blood on the cross for us. Your breath in 
worship set and I'm so thankful to be together as a family. I want to recap just some quick lyrics from that first song. You tell broken things be healed and they're whole. You tell fear it has no place and it must go. You tell death it has no chance it won't win. And if you are for me God what can come against me? Pastor Jason had some really powerful words today, and I want us to remember that no matter what is going on in our lives, our God is bigger. Our God will win. Let's close today in prayer. Hey God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a God who loved us first, and thank you for loving healing and restoration. Thank you that you modeled that for us by sending your son Jesus to rescue us and to bring us back into relationship with you. Once again, Lord, we love you and we're just grateful that we got to worship you and we got to learn a little bit more about who you are today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. See you next week.